Good afternoon. So we're going to talk about urban planning today. So urban planning is really just the idea that we want to plan the key elements of our cities. We want to really plan how our cities are growing and developing. So there's a pretty long history of urban planning. Um, one of the first kind of pieces or histories of urban planning was called the Grand Manor. Um, or Marin Marinier for French. Um, so this style of urban planning was really the idea that there was a coordinated design for streets and avenues. And these streets and avenues would connect various monuments, uh, statues and other focal points of the city. Uh, there was really attention to the topography of the site. So the city was aligned to create these sweeping vistas where you could overlook certain areas of the city or certain landmarks. Uh, so for example, you see the Champs-Élysées, the picture uh, from Paris. So there's really a focus on these broad avenues that have very sweeping views of the urban area and really give you a good sense of the urban form. And then you also note um, on that same picture that there is really there's really strong attention to the streetscapes and particularly for the main streets on the city. So you see for the Champs-Élysées, there's this beautiful boulevard that has a very large um, pedestrian uh, section, sidewalks on both sides, and it's tree-lined and has a sweeping vista across the city. So that's kind of the idea behind this uh, style of urban planning. This style of urban planning actually was utilized in Washington, D.C. Um, so you can see in these two pictures, D.C. Uh, was laid out in kind of the same style, this grand sweeping style. Um, and the first area was uh, L'Enfant Plaza. So there was the plaza in D.C. that we, they wanted to be kind of the focal point of the city. And so pieces of the city in avenues kind of came together to really give you a good view of that part of the city and really prominently showed the Capitol um, as the Capitol uh, building in DC is actually on a hill. So it's kind of this broad vista of the city where it's very beautiful and picturesque. And as you can see here, the kind of what I mentioned where the Capitol has this broad vista you can see all of the buildings. It's very clear that all of the, the Washington Monument, the Lincoln Memorial, everything is kind of lined up in this very clear center spread. Um, so you can see that there's kind of this very clear emphasis on beauty and aesthetic, and also it's conveying uh, power and wealth as well, because you can see it's very laid out and it's very uh, Greco-Roman in a lot of the stylistic components of the city. So another point of kind of urban planning was planners wanted cities to operate efficiently. They really wanted to have kind of some way where the city was able to be very efficient in its operation and not so congested. Um, and as you can see in this picture here, there's kind of this congestion. And so part of the development of American and European cities was to demolish older buildings. And they would demolish the buildings. And this would allow them to kind of regularize Paris. Um, and when I mean regularize, what I'm talking about is creating these long sweeping boulevards that aren't cut up into these smaller streets. There's a lot of open space and it's very uh, kind of more picturesque. Um, but recently, and this process has been going on for quite a while, uh, the demolition of old buildings to build new buildings ha has kind of a more common name, which is urban renewal. And so urban renewal has a, a fair amount of negative connotations, um, specifically in the 50s and 60s. And part of the reason for that is that there was this idea that they could develop cities to be 
better versions of themselves. But a lot of the urban renewal was conducted in low income areas or black neighborhoods where they would demolish entire neighborhoods that had a very vibrant street life. And in doing so, they kind of destroyed the fabric of community and displaced many residents who weren't really compensated for a lot of their, um, a lot of their losses. So there's a kind of this push and pull of urban renewal that's really important when you're thinking about it. It's not just about efficiency. This also has a very particular impact and a very negative impact on a lot of residents in the communities that they live. Another part of urban planning is kind of equity. So how do we equitably make a city fair? Um, and I think it, it's first important when we're thinking about that to recognize that the poor and people of color are often neglected and not taken, their concerns are not taken seriously by city planners and by urban planners um, and by the broader society. And so part of that is, as you can see, in this map of Dallas, uh, Dallas has launched a series of transit-oriented developments. And so what I mean by transit-oriented developments is that there are kind of these apartments and mixed-use buildings that are being built next to transit stops. And the idea is that these investments uh, in these transit-oriented developments are going to give the city and individuals in the city the opportunity to um, reinvest in those communities. Part of the problem with that though, is that it also, uh, similar to gentrification, can actually displace a lot of residents. And so because of that, there needs to be a lot of consideration for when you're building these projects, that you really are considering the impact that these projects have on the residents and the residents of the communities that they live in. We also want urban planning to be environmentally friendly. So what we mean by that is that there should be parks in cities and there should be kind of a consideration to reduce pollution in cities. Um, and so you've seen that recently with, and actually China's a really good example where they're moving a lot of factories out of kind of the centers of cities and pushing them towards the countryside or making them, uh, cleaner in their operations. Other example is you see in a lot of cities, the development of new parks. And so part of this is because these cities uh, in a lot of lower income neighborhoods and neighborhoods with high population of people of color, they did not actually build parks because the government did not invest in those communities. And so part of the incentive now with environmentally friendly and equity planning is to give those communities parks and some green space so they are not burdened uh, more so than other communities. So there are some particular kind of styles to urban planning um, and kind of some movements in urban planning. The first one is the garden city movement. So this movement really kind of advocates on what a modern city should look like. And so you see here that there's a couple different, so we have this first um, visual kind of of what a city should look like. And you see very clearly there are kind of this idea that a city should really be uh, very natural and have a lot of different kind of natural pieces to it. There should be a lot of nature in the city. And you can see on the right, there's the center city, there's these railways moving between cities, then there's these roads moving between cities. So there's kind of this natural country uh, area between the cities that really allows them to be beautiful. Um, and it's really, the Garden City movement was meant to be kind of these little self-contained cities that have a good balance of jobs, housing, and retail. And these cities were kind of first thought of uh, or brought up with the idea that the public controls the land. So people would lease their property rather than buy it outright and the land would be held in some sort of trust, either by the government or a corporation. And so you can see that these cities have kind of these certain population 
uh, amounts. So it's very specific. Um, and a lot of times these cities were really designed to be self-sufficient. That was really the movement behind these cities. Um, so there could be this kind of beautification and cities could be very quaint and bucolic. So the next kind of style or idea of what a city could be was Towers in the Park. Um, and this was proposed by Le Corbier. And he had this idea that while there could be extreme density in cities, there should also be nature and it, cities should be kind of beautiful. And so there was this idea that we could pack a lot of residents into these kind of tower buildings that you see here, but then there would still be nature around them. So while there would be these kind of buildings that had significant density, they would also be kind of in this park-like setting. So the residents could access nature if they really wanted to. And these features would be um, spread out. So they would be kind of all distant so the downside to this is that even though these cities had these beautiful, or the design of this was that these cities would have these very beautiful lush parks in them, that these cities didn't really allow for walking. Um, the idea was that you would need a car to get between all of these, you know, the residential, the commercial, and all these pieces, you would need cars. Um, one of the actually, areas or cities that was really built to this form was Brasilia, which was the capital of Brazil. And it was designed to be very monumental and spacious. But the downside is that it really focused on the car. And so there were these very dense, segregated areas where you had only residential, only commercial, only industrial, only governmental. And then to get between those areas, you had to drive. So that was one of the kind of focus points of that, but also one of the downsides was that there was this heavy focus on driving. And you can see here kind of what I'm talking about with the focus on the segregation of the different use types. There's residential, there's commercial, administrative, entertainment, but they're not mixed. The residential is only in residential, commercial only and commercial, administrative only and administrative. So this really focus on keeping these types of uses separate. The next idea was the Broadacre City, um, which was proposed by Frank Lloyd Wright. So as you can see here, this was really focused on the private ownership, which makes sense because Frank Lloyd Wright was an American architect. And so this really dispersed people and all of these kind of places were connected by a highway, but um, these, the city was made up of large privately owned plots and the planning was kind of for a dispersed people. So people were allowed to have a lot of land, acreage, and all of these residents would commute by car to their jobs in the city and then come back to their homes at the end of the day. And in many ways, this is kind of very similar to how we think of our modern suburbs where people go to work and come back home, but there's not really this, there's not really, uh, you can't stay in the suburb uh, or you can't walk to work. That's not really something that it occurs in most suburbs. So urban planning is very political. And I think that that's really important to think of. Um, there's a complex interaction between the local, state, and federal government for urban planning. Uh, I think the most important thing though with urban planning is that most urban planning is very, very local. It, uh, urban planning is something that most cities have an urban planner and most regions kind of have these regional groupings, as you can see for Connecticut, these regional groupings of governments and they kind of coordinate planning. And there's a lot of different 
in uh, stakeholders in this process. As you can see, there's the financial interests, the developers, the lobbyists, the attorneys, the city planners, the news media. And so all of these individuals interact to produce urban planning. But one of the most important things about urban planning is that it's really, really local. Um, the federal and state government both have very small roles to play in urban planning. Um, and this is not true in many countries, but in the United States, local urban planners are very, very powerful compared to many other countries. So kind of what are the steps and the tools in the planning process? So obviously we always need data. We need data to, and to collect data to actually make informed decisions. Um, we will formulate some sort of goal. What do we want this area to look like? What do we want it to be developed into? From there, we will then create a plan. So we'll actually plan out the development of an area and then it will be implemented. In all of these steps, there are stakeholders who are going to be interacting and working through the process to develop and have influence in each one of these unique pieces. And in each one of these unique pieces, there will be um, a pretty consistent use of uh, GIS software, as well as selecting the physical sites. So it's a very intensive process and a very multifaceted process that has a lot of different steps to actually create the city or the area that you live in.